We are in Mark chapter 10, everybody. After a, a break last week for Dr. Seltz. And you'll probably remember this, that our last section had to do with, with marriage and divorce. Um, you know, Jesus really kind of t turns things on its head uh, with what he has to say about the lifelong nature of, of the, the holy estate of marriage. Uh, he, remember we said that when, in Judaism, the man uh, could put away his wife, but there was really no provision for the wife uh, putting away her man. Uh, there was enrollment law, um, but, but J Jesus flips it and, and protects both parties to the marriage from the, the one who would put the other away uh, by, by saying, therefore, uh, uh, let's see, uh, what, what, what therefore, whoever divorces his wife and marries another uh, commits adultery against her, and if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And so it's not as though he gives them both permission, rather he protects both from the, you know, the, the, the erring spouse. And now we move on to children. Beginning in verse 13. Let's open with prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, in your word you reveal to us uh, your son Jesus and all that he's done for us to uh, rescue us from our sins and from the power of the devil. May the words that we're about to study strengthen our faith in him and help us bear witness uh, to uh, all that he's done for all of us in what we say and do. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So beginning in verse 13, they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Okay, let, let's just, let's stop there and uh, break this down. This is a, a very familiar text. It shows up in the, in the liturgy. Uh, the liturgy of what? Where do we hear these words said on a fairly regular basis? In the baptism liturgy. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, but for now, let's, let's focus on the, the original context. So it, it, it literally is they. Uh, who, who's the they? I think best guess would be the parents of the children are, are, are bringing the, their, their, their children. So they were bringing and... Um, Greek can do this where you don't have to have a separate pronoun, a possessive pronoun there. It, 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 it's, it can be assumed that the, the children that are being brought are the ones belonging to the ones bringing them. So they were bringing their children, but it, is, you know, it doesn't come out saying that, I suppose. They were bringing their children to him that he might touch them. And, and where, where have we seen this before? <coughs> What context have we seen Jesus touching people before? Well, when, he heals. when he heals. When he heals. Yeah, pe people were bringing their sick to Jesus, and he touched them that they may be healed, or they, they would bring their, their sick to them that he might lay his hands on them and they might be healed. But there's nothing in that, there, there's nothing in the text that says these children were sick. And so there's no real good reason to assume that they were. So then, why might these people be bringing their children to Jesus? What, what, what does it mean in this context for Jesus to touch them? Receive a blessing. Yeah, we'd say, you know, like, like, receive a blessing. And, and, and let's unpack that. I mean, what, 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 what does that mean to, to receive a blessing? They too are 
can be impacted by the Holy Spirit. Okay, r right. To be granted favor. Yeah, I, th I think something like it. To be granted favor that that uh, they recognize Jesus, if, if not it fully as the Savior of the world, that they recognize that He's sent from God, that 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 He has divine power. Uh, that he's come on a, a very important mission for, for all of us, and therefore it's important to receive favor from this one, to be embraced by this one. Um, so um, I, I guess kind of like, uh, you know, the, the blessing of a house, right? And you, you, you pray God's protection of the, the rooms of the house, of the house itself. And, and so likewise, the children aren't sick now, but that to, to be favored by God would, would mean a, a certain kind of protection for, for the rest of their lives, um, a certain sense of security. Uh, anyway, uh, we, we, we get what, what the touching literally means when we see Jesus actually uh, fulfill the request at the end. He takes them in his arms and blesses them, laying his hands on them. But we'll get to that in a second. But the disciples rebuked them. Why, why might they rebuke the children? Why might they rebuke these people for, for bringing their children up to Jesus? Oh, that they were too un they were they weren't that important, and we need we have other we have better things to do. Yeah, we, uh, we 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 dealt with this. You know how quickly the the disciples forget what Jesus has taught them. If you go back to chapter uh, nine. Remember the whole business of who's the greatest? If you go back to uh, beginning in verse 33, they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So Jesus has already told them. Life in the kingdom means receiving children. It means welcoming children. Uh, and how quickly uh, they forget. Do, do we have any uh, experience with this? What, what what do a lot of children tend to bring with them? Into <laughs> any, noise. Any, noise. Noise. <laughs> noise. My kids just moved in with me. And, and, and so <laughs> what happens when a bunch of children are noisy in church? What's our attitude toward that? Push. Push. Take them out. Take them out. We have a, we have a cry room for you people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? We rebuke. So... so we, this is a kind of a perennial problem. <laughs> the, the place of children in the church. Right? Um, there was, a, I, I forget, I want to say it was in a, you know, somewhat one of these uh, child rearing books that, that Jill and I read uh, uh, way back before Annie and then, you know, discovered that these people don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> uh, but but it, it, in, in this particular book, it, um, it, it uh, quoted or ha had an excerpt from like an Ann Landers column or a Dear Abby column where the, the woman was writing in and, and she's expecting her first child and she is very nervous, uh, very anxious because she is, she keeps an immaculate house. <laughs> okay, and and she's almost she, without you know this is before it was was common to, to, to use OCD, but but she self described herself as as an OCD kind of person, and what on earth am I going to do uh, with 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 a, a you know a little child running around and, and, and destroying things, and and uh, Ann Landers or or uh, Abby right uh, they were sisters right or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, writes back saying, uh, here's what you do. You, you put a playpen in the middle of the living room. And when things get so difficult for you, 
to get in it. You <laughs> yourself get in it. Because that will be the only space <laughs> that will give you peace of mind <laughs> in the playpen. But, but translate that to the church, yeah. right? All the adults can now go to the cry room. <laughs> right? Um, because that's exactly what, what, what Jesus is teaching here in, in terms of uh, turning the, the culture's expectations on their head and welcoming the child, making the child more important even than, than, than the adults. Let the children come to me. He's very displeased with the way the disciples have uh, handled the situation, rebuking these people for bringing the very ones that Jesus wants to bless. Um, and, and this does, uh, it reminds me of this. Go back in, uh, in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 48. This is a pattern, actually, throughout the scriptures. It's there, even if it doesn't, uh, you know, come out with a, a sign saying this is what it is. Um... So in, in 48 and 49, we have Jacob blessing his sons uh, prior to, to, to his death. And uh, beginning in verse, uh, well, how about we start in verse, well, let's read the first verse and then skip down to 8. After this, Joseph was told, Behold, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Okay, and now let's skip down. Yeah, 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 okay, skip down to eight. Skip down to eight. When Israel, Jacob, saw Joseph's sons, he said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, They are my sons, whom God has given me here. And he said, Bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. So Joseph brought them near him and he kissed them and embraced them. See? You know, touching. He kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face and behold, God has let me see your offspring also. Then Joseph removed them from his knees and he bowed himself with his face to the earth and Joseph took them both. Now picture this. Ephraim in his right hand, so here's Joseph, Ephraim's on his right hand, toward Israel's, you know, Jacob's facing him, toward Israel's left hand. And Manasseh in his left hand, so, so Manasseh is on Joseph's left, toward Israel's right hand. Okay, here, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm Jacob, right, here, here's my right hand, here's, here's uh, uh, Manasseh. Uh, and Israel stitch, stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim. He crossed over, see? And left hand went to Manasseh. So instead of the right hand going on the older one, the right hand went on the younger one. And the left hand went on the older one. Crossing his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. And in them let my name be carried on in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. Ah, it, just like it displeased the disciples. Be bringing the children to him, right? Uh, and he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's hand to Manasseh's head. That, that, that's, a, that's almost Keystone Cops here. No, no, no. Let's rearrange these hands. It's a game of Twister. And Joseph said to his father, Not this way, my father, since this one... Can you imagine? They got to touch back then. What does that mean? <laughs> remember, I'm old enough to remember when we could do that. When we could actually have physical contact with other human beings. This is refreshing. Or criminal, depending on how you look at it. Arrest these people. And Joseph said to his father, Not this way, my father, since this one's the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. 
But the father refused and said, I know my son, I know. He also shall become a people and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessings, saying, God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. Then he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Okay. Uh, several points to be made about this and how it relates to the Mark 10. First of all, what, what, what's strange about Joseph coming with his children to be blessed in the first place? Before we get to the Ephraim before Manasseh business, what about Joseph vis-a-vis -vis the sons? We know Jacob is blessing his sons in these two chapters. And we know here it, it says, and he blessed Joseph and said, that's verse 15, he blessed Joseph and said, now, how did he bless Joseph? What, what, what's the blessed, who's being blessed in the following, in the words that he actually says? The children. See, see how upside down that is? Because you would expect that, okay, he, he would bless Joseph and the sons would be blessed through their father. But instead, he blesses the sons and the father is blessed through his children. All right, upside down uh, point number one. Then you've got, of course, the, 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 the reversal of not the firstborn, but the secondborn getting the greater blessing, getting the first blessing. Ephraim over Manasseh. Also, not the expectation. Though, where have we seen this before? Where the younger son is put above the, the older son. Cain and Abel. Well, you could, Cain and Abel, Siri says. Uh, but what happened to, to the, the sultry female voice I'm used to? Uh, <laughs> Uh, Judah. Cain and Abel. Judah. Judah. Yeah, Judah's not the, that's right, that's right, which is about to happen, in yeah, fact, in, in, in the blessings themselves. How about the guy doing the blessing in this scene? Yeah. Uh -huh. Jacob. Jacob. Yeah. Jacob gets the blessing over Esau, right? But, but you go back in time, I mean, th this has been the pattern all along. Abel over Cain, right? Um, uh, Isaac over Ishmael. Ishmael is the firstborn, okay, granted it's not through the one that, that God promised, but he's older than Isaac, and yet Isaac gets, gets the promise, and then Jacob and Esau, and now Ephraim and Manasseh, right? So we have this pattern of the younger being shown the privilege in the kingdom. Um, how about the wilderness wanderer? Who actually got to go into the promised land? The younger generation. Everyone over 40 who left, you know, everyone who left Egypt at the age of 40 or above did not make it in. Except what, Caleb and, uh, and Joshua, right? But, but it, was, it was the next generation, the younger generation, that, that got, the, got to got, you know, the promised land, not, not the old. And then you, you go into the, the New Testament and this sets up even for, it's not as, as clear, but it's there. Christ himself. Christ himself. Um, Christ is the second Adam. Adam gets cursed. The second Adam gets resurrection, gets blessing, right? But not only that, but Christ is the what? The first fruits of the resurrection. What does that imply? Or the firstborn of the dead as well. What, what does that imply? He's the first, therefore. He has the inheritance. Well, if, if he's the first, the second, get the first. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The yeah. Second. There's more to come. Uh -huh. That's so, us. Yeah. So think about that. Jesus is the one that bears the wrath of God on the cross. He's the, the first, the older son. He, he gets punished. 
the, the second born, the subsequently born, just get the blessing. See? Yeah, Ron. Doesn't it say somewhere that the firstborn is a sacrifice or something like that? Mm-hmm. Yes, it, it, exactly. I mean, going back to the, uh, the, the, the Passover, you see, and you, you have the, the, the firstborn, and, and then you have the, the, the sacrifice of the firstborn, or the dedication of the firstborn at least. Not, not the actual, but, but all that anticipates, right? The, the, the curse falling on the firstborn. And that the blessing might pass to the second one, to the younger. Yeah. And, and, and so now in the way Christ handles the children, you see, children had no legal status. Children weren't important yet. The adults were. And here's Jesus saying, no. No, the important ones are the children are the children. Um, Incidentally, uh, when it says they were bringing children, Mark, the Gospel of Mark, it uses a more generic word for children. It uses a diminutive, actually, like little children. Uh, And the, the problem with staking anything on that fact is that by this time in Greek, little children had become in many other contexts just another another way of saying children mm-hmm. right however uh, the parallel in Luke let's see uh, Luke chapter um, 18 Luke chapter 18 and Luke this up mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm here all day Verse 15. Oh, look, ESV does this. Good for them. Yeah, this is exactly right. Look at verse 15. Now they were bringing even what? Infants. Infants. See, the parallel account, Luke uses a more specific term. How, how little were these children? How young were they? They, they were infants. They were infants, not able to, uh, to, to walk on their own. Okay. I, I just I, I, we'll, we'll get to this in a minute, but I, I want that in your back of back of back of your mind as we get to uh, uh, the, the the whole discussion of, of this text's relevance to the issue of of infant baptism. Okay, so now it says, "Let the children come to me; do not hinder them." In other words, uh, enough with this uh, idea that the adults are somehow more important. Uh, to the exclusion of, 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 of the children. Uh, you, you, you've got this backwards in, in a way. Um, and, and, and this is consistent with this pattern we've seen throughout the scriptures in which the younger is privileged over the older. Is, isn't that neat? I mean, even in the salvation story itself. Yes, and that's why if Grant and Dennis are raising their hands, I'm calling on Grant first. Uh, I'm afraid it's going to go to his head from this point on. Thank you, Pastor. Well, I can't wait to talk to them. No, no, no. Just wait till he has children, and then, and then he's chopped liver. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. true. Um, so I forget who it was. There, there is a, a theologian who, who once said uh, in response, maybe, maybe it was an interview, and, and the person's interviewing him said, you know, it, 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 it's clear from the Bible that uh, Jesus has a particular interest in children, or he's particularly interested in children. And the theologian responded, no, he's only interested in children. And let, well, let's, let's see what, 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 what he meant by that. It, it has to do with what Jesus says right after this. So let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God belongs to such as children. They, they, they uh, are as eligible for what, what Christ has come to bring, the reign and rule of God, as, as anyone else. And then notice, truly, it's another amen statement. It's, it's amen in the, in the Greek. We, we've talked about that before, how when, whenever Jesus prefaces what he's about to say with this word it's a you know uh, listen up you know open your ears what I'm about to say is very very significant truly I say to you whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child 
shall not enter it. What does he mean? Well, well, first let, let's handle um, this part, this this kind of ambiguity, before we get to the, the the nub of it all, which is what does it mean like a child? Okay, uh, so where it says whoever doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child, there's just no getting around this. The Greek can be read in one of two ways. Okay, how how do you all read that? Openly. Oh, oh, okay. All right. I, yeah, I, I don't mean, I don't mean what, what it means to be like a child. I mean, how does that phrase "like a child" work in relation to receiving the kingdom? In the same way as. Okay. So I think that's how most of us hear it, and I'm going to argue that 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 I think the correct way to understand it. It, it. it makes more sense in light of what Jesus has just said. That is to say. When he says, you must receive the kingdom of God like a child, that means you must receive the kingdom of God the way a child receives it. Okay? And we're like, what other way is there to hear it? Okay, there is another way to understand those words, and that is, you receive the kingdom of God the way you receive a child. Which would sound more like what Jesus said in chapter 9. Remember where we had the whole business of, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Okay, the, the words can be understood to mean something like that. In other words, you must receive the kingdom of God the same way you receive a child. But in light of what Jesus has just gotten done saying, namely, for to such belongs the kingdom of God, it makes more sense, I think, for Jesus to be saying, you must receive the kingdom of heaven the way a child receives it, or in a childlike way. And if you don't, you can't enter it. And now that opens up the whole question of what does that mean, childlike way? What about children is Jesus saying our reception of the kingdom should be like? So I feel uh, like I've always misunderstood these because I've always understood it as you have to be like a child yes. and not as you must receive it as a child would have received. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, no, I, I think you're, I'm not saying that it doesn't mean that. I'm saying, yeah, you must receive the kingdom of God. Uh, oh, I, I see. Like a child receives it or simply in, 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 in the attitude of a child. Yeah. I'm saying more like that, more like that, yeah. But but to contrast it with this alternative way, I'm I'm, I'm adding those words to to sh to show you the two ways of, of of hearing it. But 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 you're right, yeah. To receive the kingdom, not necessarily the way a child receives it, but in in a childlike way of existing. Yeah 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 something like that yeah. But but now what does that mean? Because there are a lot of attributes of. Of, of being a child, not all of which does Jesus ne not necessarily have in mind for this, this analogy. What about being a child is, is, is Jesus emphasizing here or, or, or highlighting? Innocence. Trust. Okay. Now, Sue says innocence, and I like that, but I want to be careful. What, what do you mean by innocence? Yeah, th there you go. N not not innocence in the sense of not of without sin, but but innocence in terms of no longer having developed that adult capacity to be shrewd and calculating. Is is that that's what we mean by? Although they develop it really quickly, they develop it really quickly. Yeah, but but I also heard trusting, right? Trusting. See. Um, you know, all, all, all of you parents know this to be the case, that, that there is an awesome burden on being a parent mm -hmm. because of that natural trust. Uh, I remember several years back, you want to make a quick run into Kroger, grab something, and of course, Aaron wanted to go with me, and so what do I do? My instinct, I lied. And I said, 
you, you can't go in, uh, people your age can't go into Kroger and have sex. Okay? You know, so just nip in the bud, run in, get, get, okay. So fast forward like three weeks, and it's dusk, and we're pulling, and, and Aaron sees a father and a son going into Kroger, and Aaron says, are they going to get arrested? <laughs> Why would they get arrested? It's after six, Daddy. <laughs> it's not way to go, Dad. Yeah, way to go. <laughs> yeah. You're a pastor. And I'm a pastor. <laughs> yeah. Jill's told them that Santa Claus is. <laughs> oh, we have kids zoomed in on it. Pastor, I'm saying you're a sinner. <laughs> But but it's 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 that is and, and I was telling you uh, Pastor Dalkwood even this past week how uh, uh, you know one of these days I can't tell her this yet but when I'm older I'll I'll be able to tell Annie that you know I know growing up I I, I seemed awfully tense <laughs> and would get very frustrated and aggravated with all her questions right mm -hmm. but part of it was that I know. She's, she's taking my answers as the truth, right? As, and, and so I want to get this exactly right, especially with Annie. Maybe less so with Annie, but, but with Annie, I mean, I, two years ago, she asked me about the death penalty, and, 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 and she had to give a speech on it at school. And I'm telling you, she regurgitated verbatim what I had told her <laughs> two years ago. Oh, gee, I need to, you know, let, let, let's, new, let's tweak this a little bit. Uh, uh, but Daddy, you, see, you know, Dad, this is what you told me. When did I tell you this? Oh, two years. Remember when we were in the car going to this place? Okay, vaguely. Yeah, <laughs> that, that kind of thing. You know. So when she asks, I get, I get all so nervous, and Joe says, "Just answer her question. I can't just answer it." You know? <laughs> These words will come back to haunt me years from now. Ah. Uh. <laughs> Uh, but but it all all goes back to that that trusting nature of the child and and the child who trusts especially mom and dad right the authority figures you know the adults in their life and and you can I mean that's you know dad jokes you know that's why they're so effective because you can tell your kids you know anything right and they'll believe you but that's what I think Jesus is holding out as the example for us that the kingdom is to be received in that childlike, trusting, almost gullible way, right? But in this case, not gullible in the sense of falling for anything, but, but trusting simply because God says so, right? You know, Mary's attitude when the angel tells her this is going to happen, you know, let it be according to, to your word. Uh, and, and, and so... This is what the, that theologian meant by saying Jesus is only interested in children. That, that even when the adult comes to salvation, he's becoming a child. You see? So it's, being saved isn't a matter of growing up. It's a matter of growing down. L Lewis really plays with this a lot, in, in especially like the Chronicles of Narnia stuff. Right? That, that, that when, when Lucy sees Aslan for the second time, and, and, and Aslan seems even bigger than she remembers him, right? And Aslan says, you know, I haven't gotten bigger. You've, you've become, yeah, we're, 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 you know, more of a, you know, more, more, you've become more trusting or more believing, you know, something along that line. But, but, but as we grow in the faith, God becomes, he, not that he was, you know, that he grew, Right, but we become smaller. We, we 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 grow in our understanding of ourselves in relation to Him as our Savior, which means a, a relative diminishing of ourselves. Um, and and so, uh, here here Jesus says, you know, that the kingdom is is made up of nothing but children, nothing but children. Uh, whether you come to faith at the age of of of, of an infant or or or, or eighty. Uh, in, in that entering the kingdom, you become a child and remain always a child of your Heavenly Father. And, and we know this too, right? Uh, uh, it's, it's often to our, our, our children's consternation, but no matter how old our children get, they remain our babies, that kind of thing. 
But that's exactly how it is with God. Right? We always remain, he, he always sees us in that, that childlike way as his, as his little helpless children. Yeah, Grant. I had a question about how kind of this idea compares to Paul in Corinthians. <coughs> oh, I'm so glad. Yes, 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 yes. All right, so you Wednesday morning folks, oh, it was probably, what's he talking about, Pastor McGuire? So, so it'll be like, it won't be a rerun for you. Uh, but but, but th- this, this bothered me uh, for some, t- that, that this works, that, that this concept, this, this way of understanding it works, except for, right, the, the like a glass darkly kind of thing, right? Is, is that, well, and, and he, he I, spoke, I, I was a child, I spoke as a child, okay. Yes, kind of infants and now, Christ and that kind of. Yeah, yeah. So 1 Corinthians 13, end of 13. Uh, this is verse 11, okay? Uh, let, let, let's see. Um, you know, it's, it's the great love chapter. And we're going to get the, that, that same love word in a second. I think in the exchange with the, um, the, 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 the young man who asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Um Look at verse 8. Well, we'll start there. So after the, the, the whole business of love is patient and kind, love doesn't envy or boast or count wrongs, love never ends. As for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they'll cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. All right. So, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but I think Grant's saying, well, here's a place where growing up seems to be the ideal. Aha. But let's follow the analogy. How is Paul exactly using this comparison between being a child and being a man? What's being a child compared to? Being foolish? I don't know about being, is it being foolish? Lack of understanding. Lack of understanding. Okay, lack of understanding, partial understanding, yes. Because he says, now we see in a mirror dimly. So mirror dimly corresponds to being a child, which corresponds to what? I mean, when will prophecies cease? When will tongues cease? When will knowledge pass away? The world ends. When the world ends. When the world so being seeing in a looking in a mirror or a glass darkly. Speaking as a child, that's our existence now. When do we become men? In the hereafter. hereafter. See, then we won't need these mediating influences. We will see Christ face to face. We'll know fully, right? But it's it's not that we don't become that in this life. We remain children. You see? And, 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 and therefore, our knowledge is, will remain partial like a child's knowledge is only partial. We'll see things only as you can see things as reflected in a, in, in a piece of glass. But, but there's nothing here about grow up people. It's, it's more, look, this is just the way it is. And, 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 and in fact, part of it is accepting that that's the way it is versus becoming a man before you're made one in, in, in the, you know, eschaton, in, in, in the end. And that's what Jesus is saying to the disciples, that that's the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let the little children, you too must become as children. Or, or else that there's, there's no ever growing up in, 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 in the new heaven and the new earth. Yeah, yeah. And then the, and, and isn't part of kind of the negative part of childishness, of 
the, the wanting to grow up before before it's time. You, you see, and, and so it's part of maturity to stay the age you are, to stay in the stage of development that you are. Fair enough. Um, yeah, yeah, and that, that was kind of the, the, the epiphany for me, it was that kind of that last point, that this isn't an exception to that picture, that, that it, it's another way of saying it. It's re reinforcing it. It reinforces it, yeah. yeah. That, that, that Paul is saying that to, to the Corinthian Christians, who are what? You know, all about, look how important I am, I can speak in tongues, or I can prophesy. Right? Or, you know, I'm, I'm wealthy and have to have status in the community, unlike you, and so I should be calling the shots, not you, that kind of thing. And, and, and Paul said, you're all children. You know, you, you don't get to claim manhood uh, uh, until all this other passes away, and, and we see face to face. Right now we live by faith, which means we live as children, and we see only partially and understand only, only, only partially. We, we, don't, we don't see the... The fullness of the consummation of the age un until it until it actually takes place. Okay, uh, what else? So much here, so much here. Uh, took them in his arms. He blessed them, laying his hands on them. You know, Jesus uh, shows tenderness uh, toward towards the little ones. Uh, you know, what 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 a wonderful picture of his love for for all of us, all of his children in the kingdom. Uh, but now, how about we, we, we take up the issue of this text being kind of a go-to text for discussing infant baptism. And at the outset, let's say this, that Mark does not include this passage as a defense of infant baptism. That, that, that is not its point. Nevertheless, it is quite relevant to those kinds of discussions because what is the typical main argument against infant baptism that we hear among our, say, Baptist friends? They can't reason. They can't reason yet. You know, they, they, don't, they don't understand enough. They, they, they can't think for themselves, much less speak for themselves, so that they, they'll, they'll, they, we have the thing we do, and then there's believer's baptism when, when, when you're older, right? Well, what's what's the problem with that? Who's doing the action? Yeah, who says faith is about reason? You see, and this goes back to receiving the kingdom like a child, like a child in this this trusting way, this this innocent, you know, understood in the right way, trusting uh, way, uh, not not in, in in the way of an adult. You know who who can, you know, logically figure things out and, and, and reach a conclusion on his own and, and then then explain it in, in an understandable way. No, no, it, it goes back to that childlike trust, which we all know in earthly terms. Certainly, a child is quite capable of, and all those studies about you know, uh, you know, infants breastfeeding and, and recognizing uh, the sound of their mother's voice and rejecting. The you know the the, the you know the, the the nipple offered by a stranger, right? That kind of thing. Or or, or, or what is it that a, that an infant looks for when breastfeeding? Do you know this? Again, uh, the face of the mother and, and the eyes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, think of that. That 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 the child. I mean, that's probably the extent of their field of vision at that age. But they they, they know their mother's eyes. And they trust them, and they, they receive milk from that one, uh, and and so so likewise, the that's that's the essence of faith, and and, and we run the risk when we speak this way about rejecting infant baptism on the grounds that the person can't reason or decide for themselves or uh, uh, make a profession of, of their own faith. We're sort of now defining faith as a matter of holding on to to, to certain facts. Right? And then being able to explain them. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. It, it, it's about that, that childlike trust, which, which you have even when you lose your mental faculties. Which is good news, because most of us will. Right? I mean, think about how comforting this is 
for someone suffering from Alzheimer's, or, 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 or a loved one watching someone, watching a loved one suffer from Alzheimer's. It, it, it isn't a matter of them being able to, to understand it, or, 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 or much less explain it. That, that trust, that trusting relationship is, is already there. Um, and, and, and think about it too, that w when, when we fall back, you know, what's the line that, that old age is, you know, a second childhood or something like that, right? That, that, that when, when we decline in that way, we're, we're, we're more to the point of, of being in the place where God's always seen us. We're always his children. We're always his helpless, trusting <coughs> children. We think, oh, well, 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 God certainly has regard for me. Look at the, all that I've achieved. No, no. He still sees you as that baby in the crib. And you get a better picture of it when you lose your memory. Yeah, yeah. This is kind of a practical question. If you're a teacher, and you know the stuff they're teaching now about this transgender stuff. Oh, wow. yeah. And, and even to young children, but in the universities it's all over, but mm -hmm. even to young children now in the public schools. Mm -hmm. And if you're a Christian teacher and you see what's going on here, and you know that if you mislead people, then you have a millstone around your neck. Right. Aren't you supposed to say something? Or are you supposed to just go with the flow and keep your pension and your 401k? <coughs> yeah, I, I mean, it depends on what's the. I mean, I'd have to have a, a specific case. You know, if if a, if a teacher is struggling with this, I mean, they 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 can't as as how you conscientious Christians. People that are yeah, they put you on a, a teacher on a pedestal, right? You know, and they, yes, and uh, I mean, I'm at the point I can't do it anymore. Right, I don't want to do it. Yeah. I don't want that responsibility of telling people lies or right, and, and I, that that's probably the right call. Or even being around where it's yeah. happening. Yeah, right. But at, at the very least, if yeah, you can't, if they make you say it, you you don't. If they make you teach, I mean, w w Jesus just warned us earlier in Mark, right? Woe to the ones who causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin. Mm -hmm. And 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 what are, what are you doing? Uh, you, you're you're putting the the, the government. Uh, ahead of God, when when the government run school tells you you must teach it this way, right? Well, no, I answer to a higher power, and and that may mean loss of job. Yeah, in in the current context, um, I've got a, a a good friend in in India, you see, and scholarships are given to to Hindus only. In, in, in the in, in the public college system, okay, which means his children can't do what, alas, some other Christian Indians do, and they they lie on the form. See, because it means a lot of money to, uh, to 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 be to be honest about one's faith, because if you are a Christian, you will not get the scholarship, and the Hindu will get the full ride. That kind of thing. And education is highly valued there too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and with the caste system, yeah, that yeah has profound consequences for the rest of their lives. Yeah. That was must be the pastor that came here. Yeah, yeah, Priestley, Follow Singh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. So how, uh, how th th that's the I, I think the how this speaks to. Um, the issue of, of infant baptism and, and, and what it is about uh, about the practice of infant baptism that's so consistent with our Lord's words here that that we would say, in a sense, every baptism, no matter how old you are, is an infant one. You know that the that the adult is becoming as a child to uh, to, to receive this, and, and that in in some ways I don't want to push this too far. Uh, Luther would make this argument throughout his career that, in, in a way, the infant baptism is likely the, 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 the more trustworthy one. Th that is to say, 
if, if you say, rightly so, that faith is necessary to receive the promise, children are more capable of faith than adults are. You know, adults, you know, come up with all kinds of ways to uh, protect themselves uh, against God's claim on them, right? And, and they may go through the motions to make wife happy or mom and dad happy, uh, peers happy, right? But, but the child is, is, is not to that point yet of, 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 of doing things to, to advance his or her career. <laughs> you, you see, uh, the, the child receives it. Now, w w why do I not push that too far? Because we, we don't want to go to the, to, to the extreme and say, well, in every single case, we know for sure that the, the child believes and, and, and trust in it. The child is capable of unbelief too, but 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 there's something to be said for, you know, it's a nice it's, it's a nice rebuttal to to the point that only adults should be eligible for baptism because only they can believe. Actually, when you think about it, <laughs> if, if 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 between a child and an adult, one's more likely to believe than the other is the child. You, you see. But, but again, the problem is ultimately that they're defining faith the wrong way. They're defining faith as the holding on to a, a certain bunch of facts and being able to, 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 to speak them or profess them. And that's not, not what scripture, how scripture defines faith. So anytime we're <laughs> defining faith in such a way that a child can't have it, we've, we've misdefined faith. Okay, how about uh, anything else? I had all these notes written. I had... Uh, Yeah, yeah, we're, we're children of God. We remain that no matter how old we are. I had all these examples of children's gullibility. I won't go into that. But I was going to recommend Life is Beautiful again. You know, that wonderful movie with, uh, with the Italian? Uh, 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 oh, goodness. Uh, uh, who, who, who's the, the comic Italian actor? Benito, Benito. Uh. But you, you know the story. You know the story. I, I want to say Fellini. Obviously, it's not Fellini, right? Uh, but anyway, the the life is beautiful. How many have seen this movie? What? You've seen it, right, Bob? Okay. I'm not talking about uh, the Jimmy Stewart. Uh, I'm talking about. Uh, you got to watch it. It's, it's an Italian. It's, it's subtitles. The first half is kind of slapstick, uh, where it, it 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 chronicles his. His falling in love and, and getting the girl to marry him, right? But in the second half, it's the Holocaust. And he and his son are made prisoners in a concentration camp, his, his little boy. And, and the whole rest of the movie is him treating it as a game to protect his son from the reality of what's actually going on, you see. And the son believes it, and they, they, you know, the son, you know, they, they're, they're well, I won't spoil it. I won't spoil it. But, but, but the point is that he, he, he takes advantage of the child's trust in him as his dad to protect him. You see? Roberto Benini. Roberto Benini. Okay, Benini is the last name. Yes, yes, yes. And I was channeling him when I was Fredo in the VBS uh, from, from several years ago. I played a guy named Credo. Credo. And so whenever someone would say, I believe, I'd say, that's my name. Cradle, I believe. Bring she face. Um, all right, let's go on to 17. And we'll, we'll just scratch the surface of this one. Another great one, another very familiar text. And as he was setting out on his journey, maybe we should pause to get the full impact of that. So it's literally, we've got the hodos word again, you know, synod, odometer, way, right? Uh, and as he was setting out on, as he was getting back onto the road, or the way, road to what? Cross. The cross. So we can't forget that everything that's about to be described is in that context of Jesus going to the cross, going to, to Jerusalem to die. The way. Uh, big word in, in the Gospel of Mark. A man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, press pause on that. What about that? What about 
man running up and kneeling before him. What what strikes you as strange? Desperation. Desperation? Yeah, perhaps. He's honoring him. Yeah, worship maybe, the kneeling. Maybe, maybe. Honoring him. But besides the kneeling, what else? He speaks of him as good. Okay, but even before we get to the words. Running while well, he was He running. runs. He now, I think we've talked about this before in the context of the parable of the prodigal son. And there's a... Uh, some, some great articles and books by a man named Kenneth Bailey. Kenneth Bailey was an American who studied in Beirut and lived in the Middle East for 30 plus years and came back and based on his experiences uh, taught the New Testament as the New Testament would be heard and read through a Middle Eastern lens. How do these stories uh, strike a Middle Easterner? And he tells a story of reading the parable of the prodigal son to a group of, of Muslims in the Middle East. And as he's reading the parable of the prodigal son, they all start laughing and say, what, what a ridiculous story. And, and Kenneth Bailey says, what part of it was so ridiculous? And they said, the old man running. See, you, you, you don't run. You know, you know, grown men don't run in Middle Eastern cultures. That's a shameful thing to do. You're, you're above that. That's what children do. Okay. So what does it tell you that this man ran up and knelt before Jesus? He was shameless. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. He was not above embarrassing himself. This was such an important question to him. So, I mean, that's important going into this, that this is unlike... A similar exchange where you have the lawyer, the expert in the law, who comes to test Jesus, and, and that leads to the parable of the Good Samaritan. Well, who's my neighbor, he says, right? That guy isn't sincere. This guy is. He's serious, he, you know, he, he's taking Jesus seriously. The fact that he runs up and kneels before him, I think, is um, uh, proof of that. And he says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Um, that right there, you know, a couple of things, you know, Jesus is going to respond to that, uh, that good teacher bit. But I think I've even preached this. <laughs> uh, I've got to add this to my to be published retractions. <laughs> uh, that Okay, so, so you hear, what must I do to inherit eternal life, right? And what strikes you as odd about that wording? Doing. What, doing. Okay, but what, what about doing in that sentence is, I mean, without bringing all of our Lutheran understanding into okay. it, right? Just that question alone, what, what makes it kind of oxymoronic? Or self-contradictory. Well, to, inherit. to inherit. Yeah, yeah. See, inherit. what must I do to inherit? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, inherit to burn. yeah, and inherit is something that just happens, right? Well, lo and behold, inherit can be used in other ways, and and it can be used simply to mean uh, to uh, receive a claim to or be entitled to. In which case, it's not as self obviously self-contradictory. But, but I've certainly preached it that way. That, you know, listen to yourself, buddy. What must I do to inherit? Well, the children, the children's message would say, dog. <laughs> right? I guess because that, that happened to me years ago, right? Uh, you know, what must we do to be sick? You know, what must we do to go to heaven? Die. <laughs> ah, the, uh, the mouth of babes. Oh, uh, by the way, going back to the children thing, you know, don't want to make this mistake. Being childlike in this way, it's not a matter of being unthinking. You know, we're not saying that, you know. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's not as though, in light of this, the disciples went out from time to time and just said, God loves you, God loves you, and, and left it at that because, after all, entering the kingdom is a matter of being a child. We've got to keep it simple. No, Paul's letters are, at times, very deep. 
and profound and complicated, right? That, that's, but that's not inconsistent with being childlike, so long as we understand, we're talking about this, this trusting nature, this, 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 this simply receiving this because it comes from a trusted source, this promise of our forgiveness. Um, because let's face it, children often ask the most difficult questions. We're, we're back to me and Annie, right? Uh, so the, and why do they ask the most difficult questions? Because they're not embarrassed the way we are. Well, I want to ask this, but I don't want to, you know, tie up pastor or, you know, have the other people tis tisking me, right? Ch 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 children don't have that filter. They'll just ask it. You know, why is the sky blue? Good question. I don't know. I just, I think it has to do with the sun and the, and the blue waves. But uh, that, that's the best I've got. But, but it's not an unthinkingness, right? It, 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 this isn't pushing us to simplicity, but, but rather a, a trusting us. Yes? The children's service is the best. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I'll just, we'll, just, we'll, just, we'll go straight from the sermon hymn to uh, the prayers. Uh, point... You know, that's another thing. You know, we didn't talk about the kind of practical implications of children in the service in light of a text like this. Um, but it, it does seem to me that, that, that we Lutherans have this going for us. You know, I've, I've read a lot from from uh, people in, in, in the Roman Catholic circles and, and then, let's say, our, our Presbyterian friends, right? You know, American Presbyterianism especially, right? What, what is church? It's 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 just school, you know. You, you sit and receive a lecture and go home, right? It's just the schoolhouse, right? The Roman Catholics if, are probably the other extreme. There's there's very little emphasis on preaching, right? It's it's the ceremony and the, and the rituals, and and what I like is the 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 Lutheran the Lutherans recognize the twin poles of the service. You know, there are two peaks. In the, in the service, the service of the word, which culminates in the application of the scriptures that we've just heard read in the sermon. Get her out of here! <laughs> you better correct yourself. <laughs> Josephine, I love you. Let the children come. Ah. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> well, so much for Sarah coming over for lunch. Uh, so, uh, but, but, but you, you know, we've got both. We've got both going on. We, we, we've got the word and the instruction, but that's not the only way the word's coming to us. We've also got the place for the liturgy and the ritual and the sights and the sounds and, and so forth. And, and so there's a place for both, for both things. And I know this, is, this, this comes up in terms of, you know, churches... Uh, get, pastors especially get anxious about the existence of the nursery. The existence of the nursery. Well, how so? Because we want the children to be part of the service just as soon as, as possible. right? And the nursery sends the signal that it's okay for your children not to be where God's word is. But, but okay, absolutely true, right? On the other hand, it's also the case that God's word comes to us in different ways. And obviously, um, a child isn't going to benefit from an adult Bible class. Right? The word's there. How dare you run Josephine off like you just did? Well, she's not going to get it. And she's just going to distract us with her crazy, childish noises. <laughs> but, but, I'm, but there's a balance between the two, right? You know, to, to recognize that. The word comes to us in different ways and in ways that are appropriate depending on our age. And that's why I think in the, the Mark text really pushes us toward infant baptism. You see, the child is eligible for grace. The child needs grace. The child is born sinful. But Jesus isn't here visibly to touch the children and embrace them and, and, and bless them in that way. And they're certainly not able to, to sit through a class and and, 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 and learn the gospel that way. Ah, there's baptism though. They can receive the water and the word. You, you, you see, you know, it's like, you know, God set it up so that, that there's a means of getting to everybody. Okay. Uh, 
So we'll, we'll pick up there with this, this young man who's quite sincere in his question to Jesus, what must he do to inherit eternal life? And, and we'll watch uh, Jesus at work on him and then afterwards uh, on the disciples. Uh, let's close in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you receive children into your kingdom and that uh, you make us uh, aware of the fact that we are always in your eyes, your dear children. Help us to embrace this fact, to uh, treasure our status before you as your beloved children so that we may grow down into uh, the promises of salvation. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen.